But coming up next on Channel 10 for South East Queensland viewers, the 10 News special on the Chermside shootings. The half-hour special, Officers Down, includes Constable Sharnel Cole's dramatic call for help. <laughs> There are chilling new pictures of Nigel Parodi, the gunman who's Queensland's most wanted man and the neighbour who says he was Parodi's intended victim. He was going to kneecap me and, and put me in a wheelchair. That was on the night, on the night that it all happened. Stay with us for this special 10 News presentation on the ambush in Hanbury Street in just a few moments. Bye for now. A desperate radio call for help from a badly wounded police officer. How Constable Charnel Cole ever made it is a testament to her courage. She'd just been shot eight times, her jaw and face shattered by the hail of bullets. Four BZ Triple One Six News. A big manhunt is underway on Brisbane's north side this morning. It was the May Day long weekend across Queensland, a cold, wet autumn morning. And a tragic start to the morning with the news very early this morning. If you're just waking up, the three. Queensland police officers have been shot and wounded. It all happened here in Hanbury Street just a week ago. A nondescript cul-de-sac in the middle-class North Brisbane suburb of Chermside. But despite the apparent calm here now, there remains fear and tension because the man behind the mayhem remains at large, having eluded a massive police dragnet. This man, another resident of Hanbury Street, believes he was the gunman's intended target. He remains in hiding, having fled his home just hours after the shootings. He fears worse is to come. He's going to do it in a big way. He's going to do it in a, in a public place. And, um, and he's not going to just try and go out on his own. He'll, he'll take as many people with him as he can. This is the Nigel Parodi police are hunting, a gunman ready for combat. These dramatic photographs are the frightening reality of the man behind Monday's mass police shooting. He'd been planning for, for, um, for a shootout that night. Paul Moran believes the bullets were meant for him. He was going to kneecap me and, and put me in a wheelchair. That was on the night, on the night that it all happened. It was Moran who called the police. I knew that he had the guns, I knew that he was crazy, he told me some other stupid stories before about other things that he'd done, 
Um, whenever he'd come round, it, it, w it was always talk about taking out a, a politician or a Catholic priest and, um, and going out in a big way. And um, on the night um, when I heard that he had all his guns out and he was going out on a rampage, I thought, well, he, he, you know, he'll take me and whoever's in my house along with him. That was why I ran for it. Paul knew Parodi was unstable. Only hours before the shooting, he came home to find his pet dog painted pink. But he just made it very clear to us and everybody else who was around at the time that, that he would do these things. And, um, and, and he would say it with a, with a straight, honest looking face that that was what he was going to do. And, and, and me and everybody else um, would, would, would talk when he wasn't around. And um, we, we all thought that, that he was capable of doing it. And, and it was that it was only a matter of time. The guy was a time bomb. The final trigger may have been losing a $20 bet on a football game. He suggested to me that we have a bet on the Australia-New um, Zealand test the other week. And um, it was just a $20 bet. I, I didn't think it was that big a deal. I, I won it, but um, he came, when he came around to pay the bet, the, the game wasn't even over. He, he didn't knock on the door, he just barged in put the $20 down on the table and, and then barge straight back out again. When you look at uh, people who commit these types of crimes, you'll find that they've had long histories of being in trouble with the police. Uh, they've got long histories of being hostile and angry and impulsive uh, at school and during adolescence. And one final stressor, one more stressor on top of everything else will set them off. Neighbours and friends who knew Parodi say the warning signs were there. In the days leading up to the shooting, they say they noticed a change come over him. A loner, he became even more withdrawn and agitated. The one friend who did spend time with him the night before the shootings has told police Parodi was in his backyard firing target shots only six hours before the police were gunned down. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's a nutter. He's crazy, I think so. I, but... Um... Um, he also he also came across like he did have a good heart, like he, he like I said he was never violent towards anybody. It was just a change that that we, a few people in the neighbourhood see him go through, where he went from being um, like reasonably calm and, and you know quiet and to um, eyeballing everybody that that went past him and um, not returning you know a friendly wave or and, and things like that. I think uh, the police were probably in the wrong place at the wrong time through no fault of their own. It's very possible, uh, given what's happened in the United States in terms of mass shootings, that other people could have been the target of uh, the gunfire. Parodi fits the profile. At 32, he has a lengthy criminal history for assaulting police, stealing and drug offences. Six months ago, neighbours reported him for stalking. He used to come and knock on our windows and shine torches inside our house. This exclusive video shows Parodi at play, but friendless. He never had any friends of his own. People would never go and visit him. Until last week, the 32-year-old was living in this neatly kept Hanbury Street home with his father. Behind this ordinary suburban facade, he'd hidden a cache of weapons and ammunition. He loved them. They were, they were his main item in life, I believe. Neighbours say Parodi would often carry loaded guns into their homes, offering to teach them how to fire the weapons. Well, I only, I only knew of two weapons. He brought one around, uh, a pistol. I'm not sure what kind. Um, he told us that he had a licence for it and um, we, we told him to, to get rid of it, not to bring it around anymore. It was loaded too. It had, it had bullets in it. Um, and then a week later, he came around with a silencer and he, he showed us that and um, told us that it fitted a, a rifle that he had. The same rifle and silencer he used to gun down constables Chanel Cole, Daryl Green and Sergeant Chris Mulhall. The weapons weren't licensed. The gun fanatic banned from owning firearms in 1985 and again in 1993. Nigel Parodi now calls himself Jesse James, a Wild West namesake who shot his victims at point-blank range. Psycho. 
introduced himself as Jess, Jesse, and walked straight past. Um, just there, yeah, guns, bugging houses. That was his comments, you know, that uh, stuck in the mind, bringing loaded guns up. Um, yeah, just absolute nutter. Just, yeah, I'm uh, probably a bit worried myself. Parodi is said to idolise serial killers such as Martin Bryant, who massacred 35 people at Port Arthur. You talk about Martin Bryant and um, and, and serial killers, and um, and he talk you talk about them as though they were doing the right thing, as they were brave people that um, that um, <clears throat> that that planned to do that and and stood stood by their plans and did it, and for some reason he respected that and and idolised these people. When you look at people who commit crimes of this sort, you'll find that they have uh, personality problems or are mentally ill. Um, most of these people in the United States or in Australia uh, are also obsessed with guns, uh, really obsessed with guns, and see themselves as being uh, superheroes uh, wanting to gain notoriety by shootouts with police or other law enforcement personnel. If Parodi hasn't already taken his own life, friends and experts agree this will probably end in a shootout. There are a number of possibilities. One is clearly suicide. Another is that they can become hostile and angry again. Uh, so uh, this person has to be considered very dangerous. I'd say it's not over yet. He, um, he, he's going to go out in a big way. I'm certainly scared of him. I don't want to be anywhere around the area. I don't know if he's going to come back. I know that he's not going to go out quietly, though. He's, he'd, he'd always say that when, he's going to, when he goes out, it'll be in a big way, and he'll be taking other people with him. And um, I think it'll be peop anybody who's in authority. Um, uh, is, that's, that's where it'll end up happening. With Nigel Perodi still armed and free, the community remains under siege. A desperate manhunt will continue with the gunman pursued by heavily armed police, chasing sights, fears, shadows. Now they're ready for the worst and on edge. It might be worth putting their vests on if they're going to come into the area. The uniformed police are um, very wary of any jobs. Um, it would appear that the uh, our friends that have been um, victims in this matter have uh, been ambushed, so we're very wary and, uh, yeah, we're, we're pretty on edge. It has shown on the streets of Brisbane's north side day after day. No chances are taken. Police carry out their duties, guns drawn. It will be repeated over and over. I hope they catch this bastard so we can get on with our lives. Disruption has been unavoidable. Authorities believe they are hunting a human time bomb. A man on a hair trigger. Schools have opened and closed. Parents delivered and retrieved their children. Worried, sometimes frightened. Yeah, I am a little worried because I, I understand he's still around Chermside. So I was thinking not to send them today. Then I thought uh, he, they have to get used. I don't know how long we have to keep him, uh, keep them at school, uh, home. So uh, I think uh, uh, they will be safe, but uh, it's very difficult. Even at home, we are not sure whether we are safe. Those fears are understandable. The Chermside attack ranks amongst the worst violence ever directed at police in the state's history. Never before has Queensland witnessed a shooting rampage where police were the target. Never before have three officers been shot at once, ambushed by a gunman firing an entire rifle magazine into their car. This chap is um, uh, a psychopath. He needs care, and needs help. And uh, if he's still alive, he ought to uh, give himself up for his own good uh, because the police service will leave no stone unturned in apprehending him. We have a massive manhunt underway that will continue until he is apprehended. 
There have been a number of sightings all around Australia and Queensland. Uh, at this stage, we don't know where he is. We're moving towards identifying those places that he's frequented as a child and as an adult with a view of establishing where he may be. Detective Inspector Graham Rinders is the man charged with catching the modern-day Jesse James, who hasn't been seen since the shootings. People do simply vanish. It may be that he has someone in the community who's looking after him. Uh, that is a possibility. It may be that he's, uh, he's, he's gone elsewhere uh, in Australia where he's not known. Wherever he's hiding, the fear among police ranks is that he won't hesitate to shoot his way out of trouble. Inspector, how dangerous is Parodi? Well, given the fact that he's already shot three police officers at point-blank range and without any provocation, that indicates to us that he's extremely violent and uh, that to us is a real concern. Little wonder Sharnel Cole, the young policewoman shot eight times, is lucky to have survived. I think I'm lucky, actually. I mean, any, any, one bullet could have done it rather than eight. So, nothing will stop me now. The early morning ambush took the three officers by surprise. I didn't know at that time I'd been shot that many times. I knew that I couldn't move this arm. It was on my chest and I knew that something had happened to my arm and my mouth. Um, so, I just... Um, I had still had my left hand and the position I was in in the car, I could get to the radio so I could use the radio easily and my mouth still worked at the time so I think I did it so instantaneously before anything clicked in to see like the pain for anything. With help on the way and in darkness Cole and Green kept reassuring themselves they'd survive the rampage. Daryl was going it's gonna be all right it's gonna be all right and he kept he kept screaming to neighbours to get inside and screaming out for our supervisor and and saying it's going to be all right. He kept coming back to me. Um, I sort of, no, he just must have known that I was doing the, I was doing the calls and um, just supporting each other. Yeah, it was just great. The 26-year-old became a hero overnight, but a reluctant one. I mean, a hero I look at as someone that saved somebody. I mean, we just got hit, and then we just had to save ourselves. The ambulance officer, I mean. I know that they don't have to come in to those sort of situations till they knew that the person had gone and, and I mean Robert just risked his life and his partner to come in and just grab me and I, actually the supervisor was first on the scene and a single officer unit he just came in straight to me and Daryl and, and I just thought my god that's a brave thing to do I mean he's these other guys are brave that came in not knowing what had happened the constable wants to return to work immediately but faces at least two months recovering. You plan to go back to work as soon as possible? Well, I know it's not going to be tomorrow. And as soon as I'm 100%, because I'm sure I will be 100% again. The shooting only strengthening her resolve. I think eventually when I get through this, it's got to, it's got to make me stronger. It doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger, doesn't it? So I think that's my saying now. A team of 60 detectives is now assigned to track down the Chermside gunman. They have few witnesses to the shootings and no firm lead on his whereabouts. He may still be in hiding or even being hidden in the Chermside or North Brisbane region. But then he may be hundreds or even thousands of kilometres away. If any member of the public does see Mr Parodi or believes they've seen him, there shouldn't be any effort made to confront him or to follow him. What we ask, of course, is that if, if there is a possible sighting that, that police are contacted, either on the triple O number, through Crime Stoppers, or through the Police Communications Centre at headquarters. People have responded in their scores. Police have had reported sightings from across southeast Queensland to interstate, but they believe if Parodi is still not in the Brisbane area, he will have headed to the bush. As a young man, Mr Parodi did work on properties both in central Queensland and in the Northern Territory. We understand he has uh, fairly competent bush skills, so it's certainly a possibility that he may have fled to some area in Western Queensland or to the Northern Territory. The, the view of the management team, the investigation team, is at times on our side. We believe that the longer the investigation goes, uh, 
uh, the more likely we are to find him. We've been really buoyed by the public response and uh, even now and today eight in the investigation, the public response has, has been tremendous. Uh, we continue to uh, look at all information they ga give us and as recently as in the early hours of, of this morning, police attended a, a number of sightings on the south side of Brisbane. Look, it, it's, often, it's often the case that uh, members of the public know something or see something which they believe might be inconsequential to a police investigation. And in many instances, they are the very things that we're looking for. So no matter how small that bit of information is, we will look at it and act upon it if we believe necessary. So people shouldn't be of the view that they have something that, that we're not interested in. We'll take anything that, that the public has to offer. Nigel, Dad, Tony and I are worried about you and I'm sure we can work through this. We want to help you. We don't want to see you hurt and the police don't want to see that either. Please, Nigel, we beg of you to contact either Dad or myself and we'll make arrangements for you to meet with the police. No one wants anyone else to get hurt, so please contact us or the police. Nigel, this is not going to go away. So please help us. He uh, needs to be brought to. He needs to be brought to justice and brought to justice swiftly. He needs to come and be dealt with. He can't just be out there. This needs to be stopped. And yeah, please, anyone that knows anything, just come and just ring the police. It'll, it can be anonymous.